uh, racial equilibrium. Okay. So what what is white racial equilibrium? Well, racial comfort, that's for sure. Seeing ourselves as individuals, seeing ourselves as just human, obliviousness. Uh, it's, it's this funny, there's like a stew inside of white people that makes us really irrational on this topic. And, and I've tried to kind of identify some of those pieces. But one of them is that we really are taught not to see this. So if you're a person of color scratching your head thinking, how can they not see this? Like, I just don't believe they don't see this. We actually really don't see it. Oh, and hell yes, we know it. And we do see it, but we cannot admit that. It's Both these things are actually true. We don't see it, and we do see it, but can't admit to it. And it, it's part of what makes us so irrational. And sick. And sick. Apathy, dominance, control. And sick. We're Narcissism, uh, all steroids. I'm working on this huge con um, contract for racial country. justice for a large organization. And where um, they asked us to take the word white out of all the slides. Mm. Yeah. That's a great example, isn't it, of white fragility? Um, so, don't name white. Don't name that. That that's our racial equilibrium, right? Mm. And entitlement to people of color's bodies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Touching your fucking hair. Russell Menachem talks about it's really been only in the last couple of decades that 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 people of color have had dominion over their own bodies. And so, so entitlement to people of color's bodies comes out in lots of ways, right? From just from just violating the space to touching the bodies to expecting you to carry the emotional burden of race, you know, all of that. Touching your but hair. You know, for me, like a really yeah. great example of the white fragility triggered when my entitlement or white entitlement to black bodies is 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 a man quietly, solemnly, and respectfully going on one. And the eruption, right? The criminalization, right? The uh, great example of white fragility, and it connected to this last bullet here, is the eruption of umbrage and criminalization uh, when a black man simply went down on one knee respectfully. Talking about Colin Kaepernick. My homeboy. What an example. So, what interrupts our racial equilibrium? Well, if you challenge objectivity, if you talk openly about race, if you challenge white entitlement to racial comfort, if you challenge uh, to the expectation that people of color will serve us and do our work for us, if you break with white solidarity, challenge white racial innocence right? oh and by the way you can download all this on handouts from my website <laughs> oh oh wait a minute and it's in the book, it's in the book. <laughs> all right challenge individualism challenge the meritocracy challenge to white authority right challenge to white centrality challenge to universalism Right? Suggesting that maybe, in fact, we don't speak for all of humanity. We speak from a particular perspective, and it's deeply limited. Okay? So this leads to white fragility. And we actually have the poster boy for white fragility right here in the front row. Because I'm married to him, and I made him pose in the kitchen. And he's like, everyone's going to think I'm an asshole now. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, they are. <laughs> Open the dictionary, look up white fragility. They're going to see your picture. Okay, so back to something more serious. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Oh. So when all of this insular, coddled environment... Um, Builds an inability to to bear witness, to to uh, uh, inability to, to have capacity to hold the discomfort. I've been thinking lately that part of what it means to be white is to never have to be, never have to bear witness 
to the pain of racism on people of color and never having to bear witness to the pain <laughs> I've caused to people of color, <laughs> never having to be accountable to that pain, right? And, and all the ways that I push off <laughs> accountability, right? Yep. And so when I thought of this term, white fragility, the fragility part, we're fragile in that we can barely tolerate the slightest challenge, right? I mean, I'll show you my emails. <laughs> Just the suggestion that being white has meaning will set us, us off. But th th there's a continuum. Um, and so we're fragile in that way, but it's not fragile at all in its impact. It's really effective, right? I need you to stop. I need to get back into my position and my entitlement and my comfort, and I will do what I need to do to get you to stop. And I think that white fragility functions as a kind of white racial bullying. Yep. We make it so yep. miserable for people of color to talk to us about their experiences, to call us in, that most of the time they don't because it's not worth getting punished more. You know, trust me, they, they take home so much of it because it so rarely goes well. Right, and I'm just going to ask a rhetorical question to people of color. We have to write. How often have you tried to talk to white people we about have to write. inevitable and often racist behaviors? And how'd that go well for you? Okay. I mean, literally, like not even once, right? Um, and so, and so it, 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 it's weaponized defensiveness. It's weaponized hurt feelings. It's weaponized by uh, denial and obliviousness. And so I'm not the, I'm not the one percent. I've never even been a manager. But I can control the people of color in my orbit through white fragility. Right. Um, and so I also think of it as a form of everyday white racial control. You you can be in my orbit and, and I'll use you as a diversity cover as long as you keep me comfortable. But if you challenge me, you're going to become a personal problem like that and you're going to be ejected. And boy, do we see this in the workplace. We want you on the committee. We're not going to pay you anymore, but we do want you on the committee as long as you don't actually do what we asked you to be on the committee to do, <laughs> right? Um, hmm. Oh, I got to read a piece from 112. People are very, very uncomfortable. I got a story that I really want to read. Um, Okay, so I was working with a group of educators who had been meeting regularly for at least eight sessions. The group was composed of the equity teams for a public school system, self-selected by people who wanted to support equity efforts in their schools. I had just finished an hour-long presentation titled, Seeing the Water, Whiteness in Daily Life. This presentation is designed to make visible uh, the relentless messages of white superiority, etc. The room appeared to be with me, open and receptive, with many nodding along in agreement. Then a white teacher raised her hand and told a story about an interaction she had as she drove alongside a group of parents protesting the achievement gap in her school. And she then proceeded to imitate one mother in particular um, who offended her. You don't understand our children, this mother had called out to her as she drove by. By the stereotypical way that the white teacher imitated the mother, we all knew that the mother was black. The, re the room seemed to collectively hold its breath at her imitation, which was bordering on racial mockery. While the teacher's concluding point was that, on reflection, she came to realize that the mother was right and that she really didn't understand children of color, the emotional thrust of the story was her umbrage at the mother for making this assumption. For the room, the emotional impact was on her stereotypical imitation of an angry black woman. As this story came to a close, I had a decision to make. Should I act with integrity and point out what was racially problematic about the story? After all, making racism visible was literally what I had been hired to do. 
Further, several African American teachers in the room had certainly noticed the reinforcement of a racist stereotype. To not intervene would be, yet again, another white person choosing to protect white feelings rather than interrupt racism. A white person who builds herself as a racial justice consultant, no less. Yet I would be taking the risk of losing the group, given the likelihood that the woman would become defensive, shut down, and the room would split into those who thought I had mistreated her and those who didn't. This happens every time you actually call it out in the moment in the room, right? And I decided to do what would maintain my integrity, and I, I called it out. And I, I called it out as diplomatically as I could. I just said, oh, you know, teachable moment. I'm going to ask you not to tell that story again. Uh, here's why. Here's how you could tell it in a way that doesn't reinforce that. We went back and forth a little bit. Uh, but to make a long story short, of course, uh, the room did erupt in twos. She left the group. She quit the group. This was the eighth session for the equity teams. Um, and again, all the focus was on had I or hadn't I mistreated her. Right? This, mm. is, this is often what happens. Mm. So whites receiving feedback of above and below, right? What, what feelings do white people have when we often try to give them feedback uh, uh, on our racist patterns, right? Tell me if you don't recognize these. Attacked, silenced, shamed, accused, insulted, judged, angry, scared, outraged. Yeah? Now, how do we act when we feel this way, right? Well, we withdraw, we cry, we, we go silent, we argue, we deny, we focus on our intentions, we seek forgiveness, we explain, we insist there was a misunderstanding. Okay. And so what, um, and what kind of claims do we make to justify behaving this way and feeling this way? I know people of color. I marched in the 60s. I took this in college. I was a minority in Japan. Mm. The real oppression is class. You misunderstood me. You're playing the race card. If you knew me or understood me, you'd know I can't be racist. This is not welcoming to me. If you You're knew. making me feel guilty. Mm. I want to say something about um, shame. Whenever white people jump to a narrative really quickly on racism, I'm always suspicious of it. And shame is one we jump to really fast. Uh, white progressives really, really like to lean on how much racial shame they feel. Mm -hmm. And I, I would actually ask you to think about on a daily basis, mm -hmm. how often do you, if you are white, feel racial shame? Seriously. Well, first of all, probably just when racism comes up, and even then, so maybe 2% of the time? Uh, I was in New York recently, and I stepped over a homeless uh, man who was black uh, on my way into Whole Foods, and I felt shame for just a minute, but then Rainier cherries are in season, and I, I forgot all about it. I mean, I'm serious. Like that, That's how that functions. I, I really don't think we feel that shame that much. But even if we do, then, then you have to ask yourself, how is it functioning? What does it do for you? What is the cultural capital that you get from that? And if you, if you can't answer that it's, it's somehow moving you forward in your anti-racist efforts, then you're going to have to get through it. <laughs> right? Okay. It's just one little innocent thing. Some people find defense, you hurt my feelings, this is political correctness, I don't feel safe. I'll just really quickly say the word safe coming out of the mouths of white people on topic of racism is illegitimate. Because what does safety mean from a position of social, historical, institutional, cultural power and privilege? No, it's generally we don't, we don't feel comfortable. But that doesn't have as much cultural capital. It's not as precious. Mm -hmm. The problem is your tone. And I know what it is to be oppressed. So, so if we think about the doc, right, the feelings, the behaviors, the claims, what could be the underlying assumptions that would lead us to make these claims, right? Well, 
As a white person, I will be the judge of whether racism has occurred. <laughs> ah, <laughs> it's up. My learning's finished. I know all I need to know. Mm-hmm. Racism can only be intentional. What Not arrogance. Intended, it cancels it out. White peer, people who experience another form of oppression can't experience racial privilege. If I'm a good person, I can't be racist. My unexamined perspective is equal to an informed one. I'm entitled to remain comfortable, so you have made a very serious social breach. <laughs> Damn. As a white person, I know the best way to challenge racism, and you're doing it wrong. Wow. Nice people cannot be racist. If I can't see it, it's not legitimate. If I have any proximity to people of color, I can't be racist. If I have no proximity to people of color, I can't be racist because I'm racially innocent. I would make a case that white people who grew up on farms and rural environments and there are no people of color around actually are less sheltered from racism because you are left to rely on the most problematic sources for your understanding of people of color. My worldview is objective and yours isn't. I don't know what else could be functioning under there. Right? So how does all that function? Maintains white solidarity, closes off self-reflection, minimizes, silences the discussion, makes white people the victims, protects the limited worldview, takes race off the table, focuses on the messenger, not the message, rallies more resources to white people, protects racism. I, I could get into this really deep, but here's what I just want to say about this. Um, the reason I like this picture when I, when I do presentations is because uh, if, for me, this is an, a, an amplified visual of institutional power. Um, I, I, and if I walked in that room as a woman, because that would be the saline identity for me in that room, um, I would, it would be visceral to me, the lifetime of entitlement exuding out of these men's pores. Right? And so, if you can see that, if you can see not only the lifetime of entitlement, but if you were to suggest to them that maybe they should have some women or people of color in that group, I, I can't know, but I believe to my core, they would feel contempt. Because they don't see the perspectives of women and people of color as val valuable. I believe that to my core. I don't know them, but I'm pretty damn sure. Um, if I can see it in them, then and I, I, I don't relate to them, right? But what version of that is coming from my pores? Mm. What version of that is visceral for people of color when I'm in the room, right? So, women of color, you wanna be the one that goes in there and helps those white women see their racism? Does that sound good? All by yourself. They need some diversity. All right. So my point is, I can be in this room experiencing sexism and patriarchy. Look at all. Number white men. And I can be in this room perpetrating racism. Right? White women don't actually land any more softly uh, on people of color. And I, I think when we don't back uh, people of color, the betrayal and the hurt is deeper. Because we have an, a potential way in, and we use it often as a way. If you don't think I'm not I'm an angry feminist, ask the poster boy for white fragility over here. <laughs> um, but our resentment about sexism can cause us to not back people of color and actually collude with the benefits of whiteness to, to get a little bit ahead, right? Okay. So I'm going to end by um, just bringing this question up so that I can preempt it because I really don't like this question. <laughs> um, and if this is the question you have right now, if you're white and this is the question you have right now, then I have one for you. What has allowed you to remain ignorant about how to interrupt racism? 
why in 2018 is that your question? Um, and, and that's actually a sincere, challenging question. Because <laughs> if you really start to map it out, uh, you'll have your answer. But I, I want to I wanna share um, what could be under that dock if we had a transformed framework. Uh, but before I do it, I want to give an example of a, a moment of racism that I recently perpetrated. And instead of reading it from the book, I, it is written in the book, but it's easier for me to just say it. Um, I used to be the director of equity for a large nonprofit. And um, on the equity team were three people, myself, the, the co-director, and uh, the executive assistant. And um, Deborah and Marsha uh, were, were black women. So there were three of us, two of us were black, one was white. And we hired a consultant, the organization hired a consultant to come in and design the web page and um, or the website. And so she was going around um, setting meetings with all the departments to find out what we did so she could build each department's particular page. So she scheduled a meeting with the equity team and it was three in the afternoon and we went in and it turns out that she was also a black woman. Um, I will call her Angela. And um, right away she had this survey uh, that had lots of questions about what we do. But I, it was the afternoon, I found the survey kind of annoying and it didn't, it was tedious and it didn't really speak to what we do. So I kind of shoved it aside and I said, let me explain. We go out into the different satellite offices and we lead, you know, racial justice trainings. Uh, in fact, uh, we went up to the you know, far north one recently and uh, Deborah was uh, asked not to come back. I guess her hair scared the white people. Make this little joke, right? Because Deborah has long locked hair. The meeting ends. And I wish I could tell you that I realized what I had said, but I didn't. So a few days later, Marsha came to me and said, um, Angela was really offended by that joke you made about black women's hair. Uh, and you know, that I immediately, I know better. Right? And so uh, I immediately understood and said, thank you for letting me know. And so I followed a series of steps to repair that. And the first thing I did is I called a friend of mine, another white woman named Christine, and said, I need to process something with you. And, you know, I, I vented my anxiety, my embarrassment. And then when I kind of got that off, we put our heads together and it's like, let's think about how your racism was manifesting in that meeting. Get, get really clear, okay? I, I got clear, and I felt ready to then come back to Angela. So I called her, and I, I said, would you be willing to grant me the opportunity to repair the racism I perpetrated towards you in the meeting last week? And she said yes. Now, she could have said no, and I, I was prepared. In fact, I thought she was going to say no. I thought she was going to say, whoa, are you a hypocrite? <laughs> um, and if I could not hold that, then I was not going to be making it an authentic repair, right? So uh, she didn't say no, however. She said yes, and so we met, and I said, I just want to own that racism and that joke. And so we talked about it, and she basically said, I don't know you, I have no relationship with you, I have no trust with you, and I do not want to be joking about black women's hair in a professional work meeting with a white woman I don't know. Right? So I just want to be really clear so that white folks understand that piece of it. The other piece that I owned was that in my cockiness, I was being the, the woke white person and making fun of the white people who didn't get it, so I was making that move, I was credentialing myself, so I owned that. Um, and then because I knew that Christine and I as two white people would probably have missed some things, I said, uh, Angela, is there anything I missed? And she said, yes. That survey you so glibly shoved aside, I wrote that survey. And I have spent my life justifying my intelligence to white people. Okay, that was just like a... Uh, I mean, because I immediately got it. Never occurred to me she wrote the survey. And you know, looking back at how I just dismissed it. So I owned that. I apologized. And then, next step I took was, is there anything else that needs to be said or heard that we might move forward? And she said, yes. The next time you run your racism at me, I want to pause right there. Notice that she didn't say if. She basically said, if we're going to be working together, I know you're going to run your racism at me again. So the next time you do it, would you like your feedback publicly or privately? Yeah, 
I, I loved her for that. And I said, oh, publicly, definitely, right? Like, I, I think most white people would have said, oh, God, no, privately. But it's a really, really, I told her, it's really important that other white people see that I am not free of these patterns. I, I run them less. I'm not defensive when I run them. Notice I never explain my intentions. I have very good repair skills, but I, I have these patterns. And it's important that other white people see that and that I have the opportunity to model non-defensiveness. Uh, and so anything else? No, nope. are we good? Yep, let's move on. And we moved on. And actually there was more trust there. So one of the things she said to me is, what you did in that meeting happens to us every day. This, what you're doing right now, this does not happen. Uh, thank you. What I'm looking for is where can I go with you? I right? repair. So I want to end with what could be under that dock if we had a transformed frame because we can't get where we need to go from where we are right now right being good or bad is not relevant right racism is a multi-layered system infused in everything whites have blinders on racism I have blinders on racism racism is complex I don't have to understand it in order for it to be valid White comfort maintains the racial status quo. Discomfort is necessary and important. I must not confuse comfort with safety. I am safe in discussions of race. The anecdote to guilt is action. I bring my group's history with me. History matters. I might see myself as just an individual. My, the people of color in my life see me as a white individual. <laughs> The question is not if, but how. Nothing exempts me from the forces of racism. Whites are unconsciously invested in racism. I am unconsciously invested in racism. I want you to imagine if, if, if white people internalize this framework, how revolutionary it would be. Right? Bias is implicit. I don't expect to be aware of mine without a lot of effort. Right? Feedback from people of color indicates trust because it is a huge moment of risk across a deep history of harm. Right? Uh, feedback on white racism is really difficult to give. How I receive it is not uh, as relevant as the feedback itself. You bring it to me upset, bring it to me upset. I, there are no rules for how you should tell me that I've harmed you. It takes courage to break with white solidarity. How can I support those that do? How can I back, if I'm not will, willing to step out and take a risk, how can I back other white people who do instead of tearing them down? Finding that one thing that I said in this talk tonight that you can grab onto so that you don't have to look at yourself. Given socialization, it's more likely that I am the one who doesn't understand the issue. Can you imagine if white people were coming from that place? <laughs> Racism hurts, even kills people of color 24-7. Interrupting it is more important than my feelings, ego, or self-image. Thank you. Wow. Here's the one I'm going to answer. I, I, uh, I, I, I really. Yes. There's a lot of questions, and I'm just going to stop it on the question and answer part. First of all, I want to thank Robin D'Angelo uh, for this intellectual, thoughtful, uh, just um, educational lecture. A lot of folks are not going to get it, but deep down, they do get it. And I think it's real important to go on to the next century, go on to the next cycle for y'all to understand that we come. And you have to understand that the people that have been so wrong have to be made right. So with that being said, if you like what you hear, please like, subscribe, and share. And we'll see you in the next video. Thanks, Robin D'Angelo, for that educational lecture that I think is beneficial to
towards all of white humanity. And it helps black humanity understand the psychic of where you're coming from. Thank you.